I'm delighted to welcome you to the Wild West of Computing Live, an oral history podcast performance from Cut Pathways. Apologies for starting a few minutes late. What we're learning, it's fantastic to have people here live in person. What we're learning is that you can move from one Zoom event to another in 30 seconds. Getting from one bit of campus to another takes a few minutes, and we're all just remembering what that means. For more than 30 years, I have started almost every day opening either the physical and now the virtual pages of The Guardian. And once in a while, I see a story in the morning that is just perfect for the day. Today, there was an article, quite seriously, you can look it up, headed, Podcast Listeners Likely to be More Curious and Less Neurotic, Study. So for those of you who have been listening to podcasts, it's great to have you here amongst friends who are more curious and less neurotic. The article went on to say they found that people who reported ever having listened to a podcast scored more highly for openness to experience, interest-based curiosity, and need for cognition, a measure reflecting an individual enjoyment of effortful cognitive endeavours. So for those of you here listening to your first podcast, you're welcome. The oral history programme in the university libraries records the real-life memories and perspectives of those who experienced the history of CMU. These interviews do not just inform listeners of the event's histories. They tell the story of how the events were experienced. The Cut Pathways podcast, which debuted in the summer of 2021, draws on the programme's growing archive of oral histories to take an honest look at higher education, exploring themes of culture, equality, and access to education as well as catalytic, catalytic points of personal growth, technological innovation, and creative development. Each recorded history is full of funny anecdotes, follies, triumphs, hidden connections, and occasionally in-the-moment realizations. Tonight, we have a special live version of the latest season of the Cut Pathways podcast. Over the next hour, our hosts will take you on a journey through the fascinating history of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. I'd like to thank the many participants whose stories contributed to tonight's programme, including several of my friends and colleagues who are seated waiting to see what's going to be exposed. Uh, Raj Reddy, Jim Morris, Marcelle Ebert, the current Dean of Computer Science, are with us, as is Mary Sean Roy Wheel. Great to have you here tonight. I hope you'll enjoy the exploration of what have some have called the Wild West of Computing. With that, please welcome our hosts, Catherine Barbera and Dave Barnabo. Thank you for that introduction, Keith, and congratulations again on receiving the Helen and Henry Posner Jr. Dean's Chair last night. Very well deserved, and we are all thrilled. Well, Dave, should we get started? Yeah, sounds great. All right. Hello, you are listening to Cut Pathways, a live podcast produced by the Oral History Program. I'm Catherine Barbera. And I'm Dave Bernabo. This live podcast dives into the university's archive of recorded oral histories to showcase the people that have made Carnegie Mellon what it is. Welcome to the Wild West of Computing. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to take a look at a 30-year span of time when the study of computers became a science. Our journey starts in about 1956 with the beginnings of computer science at CMU, then known as Carnegie Institute of Technology, Carnegie Tech, or CIT. And then we'll end our journey in about 1987 with the Andrew Project, a first of its kind computing environment that connected the entire campus for the very first time. And before we get started, we want to introduce our guests for the evening. Special Collections curator Sam Lemley will show us some items from the Traub McCordick collection in the university libraries. 
and historian Andrew Mead McGee will provide commentary on the technologies, agencies, and funding that made everything possible. Artist and designer Maggie Lynn Negretti is here, and she will be providing live illustrations throughout the evening, charting a timeline of our conversation. And finally, our band tonight is How Things Are Made. Brian Reardon, Matt Aylmore, and of course, Dave. So Dave, I have to say, I am so excited about this event. Tonight we get to unpack this question of what is computer science? But we know what computer science is, right? There's an entire school here at uh, Carnegie Mellon University dedicated to computer science. Yeah, but it wasn't always that way. So who here has studied or is studying computer science at Carnegie Mellon? Cheer, raise your hand. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. That's awesome. So, well, some of you probably know more about the technology that we're going to talk about tonight than we do. You know, I'm an archivist and Dave is a filmmaker, but we're actually not here to talk about the tech. We're here to talk about the culture and the people who made all of this possible. And it is a fascinating journey. Computer science has completely transformed our world in so many ways. And, but it started with people, a relatively small community of folks fascinated with what these machines could do. Well, if computer science wasn't always around at Carnegie Mellon, how did it get started? To answer that question, let's place ourselves in the 1950s. So computers were big. They took up entire rooms, and they cost a lot. You were looking at about $150,000 in 1959 for the IBM 650. That's $1.5 million today. Very few people knew how to use them, and even fewer people could afford them. Remember, personal computers weren't a thing yet. And during this time, researchers were wondering, is the study of computers even a science? And how is it different from mathematics and engineering? You know, it'd be cool to hear about these early days of computer science from the folks who were there. Well, you're in luck. Oh, good. <laughs> the oral history program preserves these kinds of recorded oral histories. And for the past year or so, we've been focusing on the history of computer science. That, that makes a lot of sense now. So that's why I've been conducting all these interviews with computer scientists. <laughs> exactly. So tonight we'll hear from students, faculty, alumni, and other folks who interacted with the university over the years about this question of what is computer science. And this is great because ordinarily in the podcast, we can't show you what things looked like, but tonight we can. We're going to walk you through this bit by bit. Ooh. Ha, okay, bad pun. <laughs> we, maybe we should have put a warning on this event that it comes with dad jokes. Moving on. Now, when you think about the early days of computer science at CMU, three names come to mind. Alan Perlis, Herbert Simon, and Alan Newell, the big three of computer science at CMU. And you may have heard of them. Newell Simon Hall here on campus is named for Herb Simon and Alan Newell. And Maggie will be immortalizing uh, these three figures on paper uh, for us. And I think once it's completed, we could all agree it would make a great desktop background. You may see these old videos and think this has nothing to do with you. It happened such a long time ago, and computers weren't trendy yet. There was no Instagram or Twitter. But these folks were at the forefront of innovation. They were people just like us, figuring things out. They wanted to know what a computer could be used for, and they were constantly exploring those possibilities. So let's hear from Jesse Quatsi. Quatsi began his career at Carnegie Institute of Technology in the 1950s as an undergraduate student. It, of course, had the, the three great men, Alan Perlis, Alan Newell, and Herb Simon. Um, Simon was novellist, and um, Alan uh, Perlis was first touring lecturer and president of the ACM, and Newell had a bunch of titles and uh, so forth. And <clears throat> very remarkable. They, they believed in chaos. I, it's not really that, but there weren't any rules. Um, 
And that was one of the very great, significant parts of this university, and the reason why it has become so great. Freedom, nothing like it. As Quatsi said, there were virtually no rules during these early years. It was the Wild West of computing. Computer science was not defined, so each innovation and invention expanded its definition. So many of you have studied or are studying computer science at CMU, but that wouldn't necessarily have been the case then. There weren't really degrees in computer science. This was especially true for undergraduates. Someone recently asked me about, you know, the computer science and this. There was no computer science. It was just some classes. There was no computer science degree. In fact, the first computer science degree was only in graduate school. They didn't have an undergraduate computer science degree until the 80s. That is Peg Calder. Calder studied with Alan Perlis as an undergraduate student at Carnegie Tech, uh, Institute of Technology in Margaret Morrison Carnegie College. Margaret Morrison, which was the women's school, was one of the major colleges at CIT along with engineering and science and fine arts. Calder's perspective is fairly unique because it was less common for women to study mathematics during that time. Overall, during these early years, there was a general feeling of chaos, but also possibilities. <laughs> there was essentially no structure. To some extent, I was a little ahead of, of some of my cohort because I had a master's degree already. But also, there were, very, there were essentially no textbooks in, in those days. Um, very few subjects to study, per se. So I think I probably had, at most, four or five courses here. Uh, so from a graduate student standpoint, there was very little structure. Uh, we were encouraged uh, to get into research uh, almost immediately, and we all did. That was Peter Freeman. He was a student at CIT in the 1960s, and he received his PhD in computer science from CMU in 1970. It's funny to think about this culture of chaos, of freedom, of exploration, and how it is all tied to these gigantic machines. These computers require so much careful planning. They had to buy or rent the computer, they had to find space for it, and they had to maintain it. And all these careful steps allowed them to thrive in this chaos. To understand the physicality of these machines, we need to go back in time even further. So let's look at the origins of the computer. I see Sam uh, Lemley is over here uh, with a, a whole table full of items. Uh, Sam, what do you have for us tonight? Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Kate. So um, I'm going to be talking about the prehistory of computer science. And I'm going to illustrate my talk with three objects from the university's special collections, which is in the libraries. And given the collection's strengths in the history of computing, it's we're sort of spoiled for choice. We have everything from a uh, book printed in China in 1830, 1883 on computational methods and the use of the abacus, all the way to a Enigma machine uh, famously used by the Nazi military and decoded uh, by a team of cryptanalysts at Bletchley Park led by Alan Turing. Um, but instead, I'm going to sort of focus in and go 300 years farther into the past and talk specifically about the German mathematician Gottfried Leibniz. And each of these three things that I have on the table here uh, illustrate kind of the range of what he was up to over the course of his career. And I know in many ways this is not ideal. You probably can't see what I'll be gesturing toward on the table, but I will leave them here so I invite you to come up after the event. I'll stand here with them and answer any questions you might have. So Leibniz, pictured here, 
very impressive hair, uh, is probably most well known as um, being the, the a sort of uh, independent discoverer of calculus, right, um, along with Newton. Of course, Newton is generally recognized as having the priority, uh, but Leibniz was the first to put calculus in print. And this first book that's on the table here, right here is um, Leibniz's Nova Methodus, which is the first time that calculus, as we recognize it, appeared in print. And the book, it's a little bit deceiving given its length. This is actually only a single article. It's about seven pages uh, that appears in an academic journal uh, called the Acta Eruditorum, or Acts of the Learned. Uh, and as I said, it was published in 1684 in Leipzig. Um, but that's just one point I like to make when I talk about Leibniz. Um, not only was he incredibly revolutionary in his ideas and his mathematics, uh, but the 17th century um, was revolutionary in inventing the genre of the academic article, essentially, right? And we're all familiar with that genre now. Um, but the advantage of it is that you could publish short form scholarly discoveries relatively quickly, right? So every month, um, the publishers of the ACTA would issue you know, 30 pages of mathematical content, scientific papers. Uh, and that way, science could move forward much more quickly because you were sharing, sharing new discoveries. Um, so Leibniz uh, discovered calculus, published it first. Um, and because he published it before Newton, uh, we still use his style of notation. If you've ever taken a calculus class, um, you will recognize the symbols that he's using on the page here. But more relevant to this evening, I want to talk about another article that Leibniz published um, a few decades later in 1710. And uh, this is his um, Brevis Descriptio Machinae Arithmeticae, or a brief description of an arithmetic machine. I'm showing the illustration up here on screen now. Um, but this is the first time ever that a mechanical calculator, uh, sort of rudimentary computer, uh, appeared in print. Um, and in the description that accompanies this illustration, Leibniz is very clear. His objective is to design something, to build something that makes um, arithmetic um, easy, fast, and reliable. So this is really a milestone moment in the history of computing because before this, right, you sort of uh, had pen and paper. You were sort of, uh, of course, and I'm talking about in the West, we can talk about the abacus, but uh, that's separate from this conversation. Um, but it's a really important moment in the history of computer science. Um, and next to this article, um, which again, you can come up and see after the event, we have a replica of this device. And this is Leibniz's stepped reckoner. Um, famously, it's the first mechanical calculator to use something called the Leibniz wheel, which is a certain type of gear that Leibniz invented. And it was the first calculator to um, do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, so all four arithmetic operations. Um, Leibniz's machine wasn't entirely groundbreaking. Breaking. Um, Blaise Pascal, who is a French mathematician, uh, invented his own mechanical calculator, which he called the Pascaline. But that was only capable of doing addition and subtraction. So Leibniz's really represented a leap forward uh, in mechanically assisted computation. Um, so again, I'm going to describe this briefly, but you'll have to come up and look more closely. There are sort of, uh, there's an input and an output, right? So uh, on the front panel, there are these dials where you can enter the digits you'll be calculating with. There are eight of those. And then on the upper panel, there are 16 windows that would display the output, the result of the calculation. Um, and what that means is that at, at a maximum, you could multiply an eight number digit by another eight number digit for a 16 digit result. So it's really phenomenal that something that's made up entirely of brass um, is capable of that fairly high, high order mathematical arithmetic. Um, so that's, that's really, really all I have. Again, uh, one, one point I wanna make is that Special Collections is open for researchers. Um, so if any of this has piqued your interest or if you want to schedule uh, time in the collection, if you're a student in the audience and have a research project that would benefit from access to some of these materials, uh, do feel free to reach out and we can correspond further. Thanks, Sam. 
So for the majority of the computer's history, from these early calculating machines to the computers of the 1950s and 1960s, these were rare items. They weren't available to the general public, and you couldn't just go out to a store and buy one. Uh, and they were complicated and expensive to run and maintain. You needed to learn how to use them. So hey, Dave, have you ever used a punch card? Uh, well, yes and no. I've, I've never used a punch card with a computer, but I have punched out musical notes on this music box. Uh, I'll give you a little sample. It's not too awkward for me to do this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a punch card of sorts. So who else here has seen or used a punch card? Raise your hand or cheer. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know, the punch card allowed a user to communicate instructions to the machine, just like Dave used a punch card to communicate instructions to the instrument. And who better to explain this idea than Raj Reddy, who came to CMU as a professor in 1969. He was part of a second wave of faculty that brought new ideas and approaches. For example, in 1979, Reddy co-founded the Robotics Institute at CMU. And in the 1990s, he became dean of the School of Computer Science. Reddy traces the idea of punch cards back to the 1800s to something called the Jacquard loom. And so what you did was you punched everything into cards, and you had a card reader read all the things and did some computations and print out some intermediate result. And then you took the intermediate result and fed it back into the computer and did the next count. So you had to kind of conceptualize saying what can you do, how big, and in what order you would do it, and so on. That was anticipated by Babbage when he designed his mechanical machine. That was all based on punch cards. And he got the idea of punch cards from the weaving machine people, the Jacquard loom, they called it, mechanical loom. And the interesting thing is, even at that time, the weavers understood the concept of art, and digital art. You could kind of have bits, and then out of that you can create a photograph or a picture or image of a person or anything on a woven cloth. That abstraction was lost, and so when people were designing computers in the 40s, the only thing they thought was to use the computers to crunch numbers. Only in the early 60s and 70s, people said, oh, we can take a photograph and scan it and make an image out of it, a digital picture, and then we can process it and do something. The concept of processing of the image was not there, but the idea you could represent an image in some abstract notion, and then you could use that digital card, punch cards, to actually then weave it over and over again so that the same carpet or same shawl or same whatever would come out with the same image each time. And I thought that was very interesting from a history point of historical history of computing. Reddy points out that even in the 1800s, people were already combining technology and the arts. So the definition of computing and the development of computers continue to advance and at a rapid rate by the 1950s and 1960s. But these were expensive machines and they needed a lot of people to run and maintain them. How did Carnegie Tech get the funds to pay for it? That is an excellent question. And I don't know, but luckily we have someone with us tonight who does. Andrew, would you mind explaining? It's fitting that we're meeting in a business school building this evening because it wasn't physicists or mathematicians that brought the computer to the Carnegie Institute of Technology in the mid-1950s. It was social scientists. It was scholars working on questions of business and society. And when the first computer arrived in 1956, an IBM 650, it was ceremoniously plunked in the basement of the GSIA, the Graduate School of Industrial Administration, for the purpose of running complex logistics problems brought by a series of young, ambitious faculty members 
who wanted to harness the power of the electronic digital computer to explore complex questions beyond the capability of mere man or graduate student employee to calculate. The story of computing at CMU in the 1950s and 1960s is one of exponential growth in which ambitious faculty convinced the university president, John Warner, and a series of deep-pocketed local businessmen to fund the acquisition of a highly expensive IBM mainframe, and then to further support the growth of a computation center that would transform the institution, turning CIT from an underfunded, relatively unknown regional tech institute into, decades later, one of the leading computer-focused research institutions in the world. In the 1950s, Carnegie Tech trained engineers and draftsmen and technologists for the regional market of Pittsburgh. The Graduate School of Industrial Administration trained mid-level managers for local corporations in Pittsburgh, then home to the third largest concentration of corporate headquarters in America. By the 1980s, then Carnegie Mellon University could claim to be among the big three computing institutions in the country, if not the world, along with MIT and Stanford. This transformation was made possible by an ambitious plan to grow cross-campus computing, to bring in a wide array of researchers, regardless of department, and share in the capacity of a campus computer. This was all made possible by a surprising source of funding that many on campus today who go into computer for, computers for the business connections forget. Computers, as we tell ourselves in America, come from garages. They come from dorm rooms. They come from lone inventors working late at the night, burning the candle over soldering irons and code. That's not where computers come from. Computers come from federal boardrooms in the government where money is dispersed. And that's how computers came and grew at Carnegie Mellon University. The first grant to make this expansion possible, $400,000 grant in 1962 from the Advanced Research Projects Administration, set CMU on a course to create a cross-campus computation center headed by Alan Perlis, collaborating with Herb Simon and Alan Newell, who had previously used computers at the RAND Corporation in their exploration of early artificial intelligence. The computer quickly became a busy hub of a transforming campus as scientists, engineers, students in the arts, social scientists, and other curious parties would bring their stacks of cards to be calculated to use the potential power of this computer. Over the years, as the 50s progressed into the 60s, as computer education would expand the number of courses, as eventually a Department of Computer Science would be established, as eventually undergraduate degrees would be in, uh, issued in computer science, the university would buy or acquire more and different types of computers. But the money that made this possible generally came from the federal government in the form of grants from the Advanced Research Projects Administration, which wanted to pay CMU to explore the potential of computing. How can we replicate in artificial form natural logic? How can we push the boundaries of calculation and computation into recreating human modes of creation? The federal government had deep pockets in the Cold War and was willing to fund broad exploration, enabling quick growth. And what made it possible what transformed Carnegie Tech from a regional institute to eventually a global powerhouse in the information society is this little document plucked from the shelves of Hunt Library. The 1964 grant from Carnegie Institute of Technology to establish a center for the study of information processing submitted to the Advanced Research Projects Administration by Herb Simon, Alan Newell, Alan Perlis, and then the dean of faculty, later provost, Edward Schatz. In exchange for a proposal outlining the center, they were given $3 million and a mandate to 
explore the potential of the computer. This would drive CMU over the course of the 60s and 70s down a path where federal funding through ARPA primarily dictated the rhythms of campus life. And at times, as much as 65% of computing on campus, especially in the Department of Computer Science, was funded by federal defense dollars. Money was flush, times were good, the questions were big. And new generations of computers came. The IBM 650 would give away to a variety of new models, often not owned by the institution, generally leased, paying large sums, but used by increasingly large numbers of students and researchers, exploring complex questions that would become the foundation of fields like artificial intelligence. One thing to note as we consider the movement of computing at CMU from this initial IBM 650 through a variety of computers produced by external manufacturers, including an IBM System 360, very elaborate, was the culture created around computing and the cross-campus collaboration, the desire to test the limits of computers. And among the most compelling devices produced in pursuit of this was a student-generated experiment, taking two superseded older mainframe computers that had been purchased by the institution, Bindex G20s produced by the defense contractor Bindex, and transformed by clever CMU undergraduates into the Bindex G21. Uh, Jerry-rigged device linking to Bindex G20s with shared memory on which students could tinker. They could explore new programming languages. They could push the limits of processing using an older machine, but not that dissimilar to the attitude that allowed students at carnival time in a normal year to gather their tools and build buggies, build displays and exhibits, experimenting, tinkering with the tools of computing in pursuit of an ambitious goal of understanding how humans thought and how this could be replicated through artificial means. And of course, what underpinned all of this for the good years of the 50s and 60s was flush government money. That wouldn't last forever. Thanks, Andrew. So speaking of the Bendix G21, let's hear from Jesse Quatsi again, who actually built the Bendix. I was asked by Alan Perlis, one of the great men in the computer history, um, gee, could you make us something bigger that we can use to support research at this place? And I built the G21, which is um, a big computing facility. It took us all the way up through being called Carnegie Mellon University and uh, through founding of the computer science department, et cetera, et cetera, and the ARPA grant that's in perpetuum, perpetuum right now supporting them. Thing. So that's my position. <laughs> it's a strange one. The system that I built uh, was installed through the roof uh, of the new SCAFE hall. They put the G21 on the top floor. And therefore, it had the very best view on campus, which tells you something. I don't know what, but you know. The people couldn't get at the view. The computer had it. It was blocking. <laughs> so my big influence was, I don't think we could have had a computer science department and the large ARPA grants without the G21. We certainly couldn't have done it on the G20 that came here. And that was because, you know, we got that one because that's all the school could afford. So in um, 1962, Old famous guy, John Licklider, uh, was at the Department of Defense, ARPA, and uh, he thought that c computers were more than just adding machines. So he won some funding, major bucks, um, for what was called centers of excellence. And that was for computing outside of counting. So um, all the other ones. The first two recipients were MIT, Carnegie Tech, 
And that was the founding money for computer science departments in the two schools. I'm not sure if they, those are the first two computer science departments in any university, anywhere, but could be, since nobody else got the dough. Uh, so the university got the money to support these machines, but that doesn't mean everything went smoothly. Uh, these machines had limitations, and the process of using them was at times frustrating. We didn't have computers, except for in Scape Hall. So you would go there and actually type the cards yourself into a punch machine, and then you would assemble them and don't dare get one card out of place and submit it to the computer center to run through the computer, which is a huge room. And you'd wait a couple days and go back. And you had, it was clear on the other side of campus from Warwood Gardens, from the dormitory. And you'd walk over there to see if your computer job was even done. And if it was done, whether it ran. And sometimes there was just a comma out of place and you had to resubmit the whole thing. And so that's how we operated. That was Peg Calder again. And uh, one of the themes that kind of comes up in a number of the Orwa history interviews that we've conducted uh, is that you can't get one card out of place. Uh, Maggie is drawing the... Writing as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie's writing as fast as she can, and she's drawing the Bendex G20 with uh, Peg's quote that you can't get one card out of place. Um, now, so when you made a mistake, it wasn't as easy as hitting a delete key. Uh, basically, you had to, and you're welcome in advance, Roll with the punch cards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but punch cards weren't the only essential tool during this period. Uh, no, they were not. Back then, uh, they used a tool to do tedious calculations quickly. They didn't have electronic calculators, so they used something else. Da -da -da. Now, Sam has a slide roll. Uh, now, you might guess that slide rolls aren't normally this big. They usually fit in a shirt pocket, about the size of a ruler. But this is a special event, and we needed a special slide roll. Um, Mary Shaw, the Alan J. Perlis University Professor of Computer Science, donated this particular slide roll to the university libraries a few years ago. Now hold on, Dave. How does this factor into our story? Feels like a little bit of an aside, if I'm honest. I mean, sure, but uh, in my humble opinion, what you just witnessed was the highlight of this show. <laughs> and we do have a point. Slide rolls are analog computers. And yes, you can actually still find them on eBay today. Maybe not seven feet long, but you can still find them. And they were vitally important for this generation but they would start to become obsolete in the coming years. Thanks so much, Sam. By this time at CMU, there was a lot of new energy surrounding computing. Here is Peter Freeman again. The focus on doing big, audacious things, uh, big, hairy, audacious things, as the phrase goes in our field, of uh, not being satisfied of just doing something incremental, but of uh, just revolutionizing things. So things seemed to be going well. The idea of a shared memory multiprocessor was in the works. Computers were getting a bit smaller. The department was starting a distinguished lecture series that brought in new ideas and researchers from all over the world. But then, things hit a glitch. First, Alan Perlis left for Yale University in 1971, which was a major blow to the computer science department. And then, this headline was published. This is a copy of a newspaper article from 1972, October. 
The headline is 40 staffers locked by CMU Economy Acts. The first paragraph is plagued with the same financial problems as colleges everywhere. Carnegie Mellon University has eliminated $300,000 in salaries by firing one of every 10 employees in its operations division. To carry out the dismissals, President Seyert appointed Ronald M. Rutledge, who was at the time director of CMU's Computation Center, appointed him as chief of operations, essentially bypassing, bypassing the vice president for business affairs. Rutledge had previously won praise for cutting the computation center budget from two and a half million to one and a half million, slashing the staff from 87 to 30, and sharply boosting its output and effectiveness. So that affected me. <laughs> not as, not seriously, personally. I mean, a lot of people lost their jobs, of course. Ron f fired all the operators. So all of us programmers had to take, you know, one or more shifts during the week to fill in for the operators to do what they did. That is Albin Varia, a former student who went on to play a big role in the computation center at CMU. The center housed the computers at the university back when computers took up a lot of space and they needed a lot of staff. This was a hard time for the department, for the students, and for the city in general. That's right. This was the same time that Pittsburgh's steel industry, basically its economic engine, was in decline. I mean, you've all probably heard of the old days in Pittsburgh when folks would take two shirts to work because the pollution was so bad. Pittsburgh in the 1970s was not a congenial place to be. I want to put this as, as accurately as possible. The steel industry was closing. Everybody, no, everybody didn't know that. Most people thought, this is just a hiccup. Steel will come back to what it once was. Pittsburgh will come back to what it once was, and everything will be fine. Uh, this is Pamela McCordick, who spent time in Pittsburgh in the 1970s. And during this time, she researched artificial intelligence for her book, Machines Who Think. Hashtag shameless plug. There's a whole episode with Pamela on our podcast, which you can listen to uh, if you want to hear more about her story. Well, that was not going to be. And those people with vision here, and I include the then president of Carnegie Mellon, Richard Seyert, Herb Simon, a handful of other people said, we're going to do something different in Pittsburgh. We're going to green Pittsburgh. And in 1972, 73, this was a, a radical idea, very radical. Okay. Meanwhile, you could go through fine places in Pittsburgh and find slag heaps in the middle of the road because, or on vacant lots because nobody thought they were worth removing. Uh, the warehouses, which are now full of high tech, they were left to rust because nobody thought it was worth tearing them down. It was, as I say, not a congenial place. And the promise of greening seemed to me to be so far away. I just didn't think I wanted to spend my life here. Oh, that's so Pittsburgh. My house is even built on a slag heap. <laughs> But you know, that's interesting to think about, that the computer science community here at CMU had some role in greening Pittsburgh. So a few years later, by the mid-1970s, things were looking up. New faculty and students were rebuilding the departments, and new technologies meant they had the freedom to try new things. Actually, I was one of the first people to get on the internet, and I could at night be talking to somebody in California using this teletype, and they would respond back. And Paul recently found a map of the internet about the time that we were there, and it had 25 nodes. <laughs> that's in the whole world. Like you could talk to Germany or other places, but that's 
the entire World Wide Web was on only about 25 places. And so... Uh, that is Nancy Newberry, who worked as a night operator in the Computer Science Department Engineering Lab. She was one of the lucky few to play games on the early internet. And so what would you do to keep yourself up at night? Well, they had these games, and one of the games was uh, something called Adventure. And so for a month or two, we, everybody who was attached on the World Wide Web, somebody had written this uh, um, word program about a little guy who was wandering through a cave picking up things. And it sounds so stupid now, but then it was just amazing. You'd find an axe, or you would find a little vial, or you would see a little stream coming down, and all of this was in words and all in your imagination. And then everybody's trying to crack the same code at the same time, and you're talking to the person in California saying, well, did you get the axe in the room where there were twisty little passages all different, or the ones with twisty little passages all the same? And and then there was another uh, computer program, something called ELIZA, and somebody had created a program where uh, this was as if you were talking to a psychiatrist, and you would... Um, say, type something into the teletype, and it would come back, and it knew how to pick out the keywords and ask you more about that. <laughs> As the department continued to stabilize, the unique and quirky culture that computer science at CMU is now known for uh, starts to emerge. Hey, Dave, I wonder if now might be a good time to talk about the cheese co-op. Cheese co-op? Yes, a cheese co-op. Let's hear from Clem Cole, a CMU alum and self-described old-school hacker, open sorcerer, and industry graybeard. The whole concept is we want you to be free thinkers and to think outside the box. So what are they going to do? They're going to say, how do we get something we like we like cheese with, you know, beer and wine and whatever. How can we, we get something at a substantially reduced rate so we can shepherd our, our, our monies, you know, whatever. And that's where it came out of. And you got to understand, you know, Pittsburgh had, you know, the strip district. Um, you know, the whole Pamani Brothers was, in those days, Pamani Brothers started, it opened at midnight, and it ran from midnight to 10 in the morning. And it was in the strip district and it was there to feed the people that worked the strip, strip district. Well, of course, computer scientists were up at night. We want something to eat. Not that many places are open. So we discovered Pamani's, you know, it, it all came out of that. Learning if they went down to the strip district, they could buy wholesale cheese. They could buy certain things they're a lot, lot cheaper. And if you've got enough people to buy into that, then you could buy a whole wheel of cheese and cut it in, in 10 pieces. And instead of paying, you know, the retail rate at, you know, the, the big bird, um, you know, it would be a 10th the price of what it would cost. Oh, and guess what? We could get better stuff. We could, you know, we could get more, more interesting things. And, and that's all how that happened. I actually just finished an interview with computer scientist Joe Newcomer, and Newcomer mentioned that the Cheese Co-op had software on, I believe, a PDP-10 computer that allowed them to organize estimated cheese prices and weights of cheese. Uh, so you would pay for a certain amount of cheese, but when the cheese wheels were actually picked up, you know, the size might be a little different, so the amount of cheese you received could vary. <laughs> And it doesn't stop with cheese. There was also a Coke machine. Do you mean the Coke machine that Maggie is currently sketching? The very same machine that is quite famous because it was hooked up to the internet, starting the Internet of Things? That's the one. And it's good Maggie is sketching it out because we actually don't have any confirmed pictures of it in the university archives. So if you happen to have a picture or other documentation of it, let us know. Okay, so let's hear from Clem Cole again. Coca-Cola absolutely tastes better in glass bottles. There's no doubt about it. But it was expensive. Well, somebody managed to get a late 60s, old-fashioned Coke machine 
that distributed glass bottles. And then what they did is they were able to get wholesale 10 ounce glass Cokes that fit in the machine. You had a choice. It was Coca-Cola, Coke, 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 Coca-Cola, or Coca-Cola were the, were, the, were the things. It was 25 cents um, for a 10 ounce Coke, which was just a miraculous, you know, price. You know, going over to Skibo or whatever probably would have been 50 to 60, you know, two to three times that. So, of course, you got people that know a little bit about electronics and you got a lot of computer power. And sooner or later, somebody says, well, you know, how do you tell when the last time that thing's been filled? You know, and so pretty soon thermal couples end up in each of the columns um, of the Coke machine. And before long, a program shows up, Coke stat. So you could find out um, what the temperature of any one column was, how many, how many bottles were inside of it, whatever. And it was, you know, it, it became a cult. Um, and of course, there, the, the, you know, there's been lots and lots of things written about it, and it, it was a very famous piece of the internet. It was the, the original CMU Coke machine. Um, and it was literally just a bunch of people trying to save money. <laughs> So by this time, the computer science department had momentum and a culture that was definitely uniquely their own. They were figuring out how to work together too, and they developed something called the reasonable person principle, which was, as you know, Dave, still around today. So let's hear from Sherry Nichols, a student in computer science in the 1980s. It was friendly, it was informal, very accepting. I mean, you know, you didn't call the professors Dr. So-and-so, you called them by, by their first name. There was an assumption that if you were here, you were good. You didn't have to prove yourself. Yeah, explicitly operated by the something called the reasonable person principle, which is we're going to assume you're a reasonable person until you prove otherwise. Uh, Kate, I'm actually kind of curious what they meant by reasonable. Well, let's hear from Dan Swarick, a longtime professor in computer science at CMU, who tells us a bit more. Alan Perlis, uh, who was the department chair in computer science at the time I was hired in June of 71, had left for Yale by that fall. And but uh, he's credited with bringing what was called the reasonable person principle to CMU. And the idea that I'll tell you my interpretation, but most people have their slightly different variations on it, but I think it's one of the reasons that CMU is so nimble and able to react very quickly. And the idea is, uh, the way I paraphrase it, is if people uh, have the same information, they're likely to make the same decision so I can trust them because they're looking out for the general good of everybody as opposed to just themselves. And so we can make decisions without having to worry about not being backed up uh, if we're sort of doing what's, what's reasonable. And then we don't have to go through the layers of bureaucracy to get things done. Now by the 1980s, so much was happening. And the definition of computer science was still expanding. New departments and institutes were popping up, and the number of faculty and staff related to computer science also increased. By 1980, there were 64 computer science faculty and visiting professors at the university. That's up from just 15 in 1966. So let's hear from Manuela Veloso, a professor emeritus and alum of the School of Computer Science. It was really an amazing place to be. You have to understand that uh, in those days, there was all exciting things. You turn left, there was exciting things. You turn right, there were exciting things. I mean, it was not dull, the place. It was extremely alive. 
it was everything, chess, uh, 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 wearable computers, um, operating systems, word processors, Wi-Fi, architectures. It was everywhere there was like excitement and everywhere there was almost everything, something new every day. So you were always like surrounded by discoveries, by novelty. As Manuela says, everywhere you looked, it was exciting and dynamic. But this kind of makes it hard to get a handle on what was going on during that time. There was so much of it, and it was changing so rapidly. Uh, Andrew, can you provide us a little more context for this transition from the 1970s into the 1980s? Well, computing would undergo a dramatic transformation in the 1970s and 1980s on the small campus bound by Flagstaff Hill and Forbes Avenue. But from a period of disarray and faculty defection in the late 1960s and 1970s, the Department of Computer Science would rebuild a core of star faculty uh, who would vow to remain in Pittsburgh and explore the possibilities of research questions that push the boundaries of artificial intelligence logic and the capabilities of software code. With the arrival of new faculty and the increased prominence of those star researchers who remain, the scope of computing at CMU would grow beyond the chalkboards of the computer science department. New related institutes and centers would pop up around campus, showing the ways in which computing continued to permeate the fabric of what CMU was. Increasingly, CMU was a place defined by its relationship to the computer. You go to CMU to do things connected to computing. If you're a computer scientist, if you're an electrical engineer, if you're a data scientist, but also if you're a dance choreographer or a neuroscientist or a behavioral psychologist or an English literature scholar interested in digital humanities, the spirit of the computer permeated the sense of the campus, creating this reputation of a computer you. And among these institutions that in the 70s and the 80s would help further CMU's national reputation and push it into new and more expansive areas of computing. We have the Robotics Institute, founded in 1979, manifesting in physical form of rolling, whirring automatons, the cutting edge investigations into artificial intelligence, into the boundaries of computing. 1984, CMU would become host to the Software Engineering Institute, a sort of jet propulsion laboratory for code, a federally funded research center that anchored a new era of collaborative project-based research that distinguished CMU in this period from the earlier largesse of the government open exploration world. Government money is tighter in the 1970s and the 1980s in the wake of belt tightening of the federal government, in the wake of rapidly changing views of the defense industry post-Vietnam, in the wake of decisions by DARPA, the successor to ARPA, to pivot funding to specific projects rather than open-ended exploration. Carnegie Mellon and its researchers would embrace more applied methodologies, more partnerships, based on the patronage of private corporations, other institutions, and specific project-driven research. In partnership with the Westinghouse Electric Corporation and our cross-bridge neighbor, the University of Pittsburgh, CMU would establish in 1986 the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. The Department of Computer Science becoming so prominent would lead to it seeking new status within the larger institution, free floating for a couple of years, and then a self-sanding school divorced from the Mellon College of Science, now its own entity, in many ways the public face of the university. By the close of the 1980s, CMU's reputation as Computer U would be based in part on the expectation that its students would encounter the computer in nearly every aspect of daily life. Nowhere was this more prominent than in a project-driven, external partnership-funded program 
that would brand CMU as an innovator in 1980s computing, the Andrew Project, named after university namesake benefactors, Andrew Carnegie and Andrew Mellon, would see a distributed network of personal computers spread around campus, in labs, in classrooms, in faculty offices, in dorm rooms, linking students to a wired network anywhere they were on campus. The university wanted to experiment with what interlinking a campus might do for research and student life. It also wanted to make a little bit of money on the side by licensing this model to other institutions and becoming a pioneer in the first truly wired campus. Its corporate partner in this endeavor, IBM, and for many years, the Andrews system, still remaining in the email addresses assigned to CMU affiliates, would define the ambitions, the scope, and the ability of the campus to pivot as the broader digital world changed. Because the 1970s and 1980s saw a decentralization of computing. They saw computers growing cheaper, faster, the move from mainframes to mini computers, to microcomputers, to personal computers. And as computers spread, become more accessible, as students encounter them at home, on kitchen tables, in their dorm rooms, in addition to the labs, as computers move from the world of punch cards to the world of visual graphical interfaces. Computers are more accessible, and CMU comes a place where people train for what now seems to be an inevitable digital future, but also come with the optimistic goal of helping shape that future. This is the place where, in the 1980s, the Wild West closes a little bit, but now it's the place with those who have desire to shape the future can direct the technology in very ambitious and optimistic ways. Well, thanks so much, Andrew. So let's look at some numbers, which were published in the Tartan Student Newspaper in 1986. In 1981, CMU had 131 computers. Then in 1986, the university had 4,510 computers. That's a 3,400% increase in just five years. Now think back to 1960, when the school was in the lower single digits for computers owned. This influx of uh, computers can in part be attributed to a drop in price. In 1986, an IBM XT sold for $3,070, which is $7,300 if you ingest for inflation. That's dramatically lower than the million dollar computers of the 1960s. All in all, computers were more widely available. There was also this growing interest in using, in, <clears throat> in using computers to help people connect. So let's hear from James Morris, a professor emeritus in computer science at CMU. In like January of 1983, I read a book called Dream Machines or something, and it was a book about hypertext, or it was a book by a guy named Ted somebody or other. Uh, the book in question is Computer Lib Dream Machines, uh, which you can see here. It's by Ted Nelson, and it's actually quite funny. Uh, three weeks before I did the interview with Morris, uh, a friend lent me this book. And it's actually two books in one with two different covers, and it's a really wild book. I highly recommend it. There's a whole notion about computers. We were all in a social revolutionary mood at the time. I mean, technologists were saying technology is going to set us free from whatever horrible mess we thought we were in at the time. Especially people like Engelbart were total idealists about making computers support human collaboration and the world will get better because we have this computer communication tools. And so it was quite sort of idealistic. In the 1980s, Morris and his colleagues had this idea to enhance communication across campus. And over the next decade, as Andrew, as Andrew mentioned earlier, they developed a computing environment called the Andrew Project, which, as he said, was named for Andrew Carnegie and Andrew Mellon. Uh, you may not have heard about the Andrew Project before, uh, but you may have seen remnants of it. So if you look at your uh, Andrew IDs, uh, email addresses, that's why all of our email addresses have the domain andrew.cmu.edu. If you know differently, please let us know. We love learning about this history. 
Anyway, I said, oh, well, the Andrew Project is going to be something like that. And I actually wrote a little essay about uh, computer communication in the world of the future. It was called Communication Through Time and Space. And we were going to build this system which was going to enhance the community and communication within the community. It wasn't just about computing a bunch of stuff or, or proving that computers are smarter than people or all the other fantasies that computer people have. It was going to be transformative to the community, I thought. Now, the Andrew Project lasted quite a while, seven years or so. There were a lot of decisions made in that time, but one of the most important realizations that came from the project was the idea that the network was the key concept, not necessarily the hardware. Oh, there was all this crisis about what kind of workstation. It was a continuing crisis. And I went to Alan Newell um, and said, I was, I said I was, I'm going crazy with this competition among the different kinds of workstations and this and that. And, but Newell said, the thing that matters is the network. He said, forget about the device. Make sure that you build the, you know, the infrastructure, the network, uh, and the, the file system or whatever's on top of the network. That's the most important thing. The device doesn't matter, which was totally right. Because if you look at it now, our devices are wristwatches and, and phones and everything. The devices change all the time. The network was the most important thing. Remember, this is the same Alan Newell, who was one of the big three of the original computer science department. And it's fascinating to see what these folks predicted. Things like the idea of these networks, communication tools, and file sharing. Were they right about everything? Not necessarily, but they predicted a lot of what was to follow. Okay, back to Jim. It was original model for a giant file system long before the internet had that idea. So we had sort of a campus-wide computer network, which was a huge community of people using a computer and having a lot of fun with it sort of long before anybody else. And it, it was a big deal. So Carnegie Mellon developed a reputation of being the place that had the most wonderful computer system. So by the 1980s, the Wild West of computing was ending. And in 1988, the university founded the School of Computer Science. It was no longer a single department. In a 1967 article in Science Magazine, Alan Perlis, Herb Simon, Alan Newell had asked the question, is there such a thing as computer science? And if there is, what is it? We've found that computer science continually reinvents its definition. What is new today is commonplace tomorrow. And these are people taking one step after another. And then looking back over 30 or 40 years, it all adds up to an impressive legacy. To quote Perlis, Simon, and Newell, there are computers. Ergo, computer science is the study of computers. Thank you for listening to Cut Pathways. And also thank you to the Weibel Foundation for sponsoring the Oro History Program, along with our other generous donors. If you want to find out more about these topics, listen to season two of our podcast, and also keep a lookout for the activities of the Robotics Project, the University Archives, and the University Libraries. And if you're interested in seeing any of the materials we showed today, contact the University Archives. Thanks again to everybody watching at home and everyone here in the Simmons Auditorium. We hope you weren't too motherboard. And we'll see PU next time. Thank you for that. Wait, wait, wait. Before we go, I want to thank everyone who made this event possible. A big thank you to our band tonight, How Things Are Made, and their terrific music. Artist Maggie and her amazing illustrations. I mean, look at those. She brought the Coke machine to life again. Our guests, Sam Lemley and Andrew Mead McGee, for helping us to tell this incredible story. My co host, Dave, for his incredible multitasking tonight. I also want to thank our wonderful events team and our colleagues who volunteered their time to help us out this evening. And of course, thank you to all of the oral history participants for sharing their remarkable stories with us so that we can share them with all of you. Thank you for listening to Cut Pathways. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.